Hi, this is James coming to you from Chicago, and I'm going to tell you how preconditions can be mixed into palm sets to create a nice model for relaxed memory. The whole idea of a memory model is to tell us what values can fulfill a read, such as this read of x here. I'm following the conventions here that x through z are shared locations. They'll all be initialized to zero. We have some registers, which are thread local like s here. And in the diagram, I'm showing you the program order that's per thread order for these two threads. And in this picture, you can sort of see that it's reasonable for this read to see four, but it would be pretty unreasonable for it to see the stale value or the future value within the thread. But these two values over in the other thread are perfectly available. If I put in synchronization here, though, the situation changes a bit because now this write in the second thread becomes stale. Labeled partial orders provide a very natural model for this kind of execution where the events are marked with their action and order represents causality. And we have some notion of fulfillment, which is that in order for a write to fulfill a read, well, it must precede it and there must be some order with every other write. And you can see here that this actually, this very simple requirement gives me what I want here. So for example, if I order these writes uh, with four before two, well, I can see two in this thread. Of course, I could order them the other way around and see the four. But if I try to see one, I'll end up with a cycle one way or the other. Thus, the acyclicity in a partial order provides a really pretty way to think about causality in a relaxed memory system. When there are multiple variables, however, it's important to also model dependencies. And we can do this by embedding preconditions into the events of our palm set. For example, here, the right of y depends on the value of s, and we reflect that in the precondition. This precondition can be satisfied by prepending the read of x, which causes a substitution. And similarly for the right of z. Note that the right of x here is independent of the read of y. We can align these tautologies and satisfy the conditions for fulfillment here, justifying this execution. If the right of x depends on the read of y, then this reordering is disallowed. That's reflected in our model by the evident cycle. This is no longer a partial order. There's variations of this theme. Instead of data dependencies, we could use control dependencies. And in this case, the program is actually data race free. If one were to allow this execution, this would violate the SCDRF theorem. So partial orders are very pretty, both for executions that we allow and that we disallow. The true test of a relaxed memory model, however, is how it deals with unexecuted code. To see why, let's take this example and embed it in a larger program. So here, just to remember, this thing should not be able to write one to Z. Let's put it in a conditional where I may have an alternative world where I actually write 1 to x. Now, it may be surprising, but this program can actually write 1 to z now. How does this work? Well, a compiler may notice that the values for x and y can only be 0 or 1, and therefore it can do some constant inlining, then lift the common code out of the loop, then reorder the independent statements, and now if I interleave these things, well, obviously, I can get one. This kind of thing is troubling, <laughs> to say the least. But if I change x is 1 to x is 2, well, then obviously this program can no longer write 1. And note that this first transformation is only valid because I've conditioned the execution on r. If I change that to a random coin flip, well, surely this is no longer valid. Okay. Let's look at these three examples then. We have one where we expect one to happen and two where we don't. The current crop of memory models falls into two camps, ones that are too weak and that they get OODA4 wrong, and ones that are too strong and that we don't know how to efficiently compile them to architectures like ARM. And now you might say, well, doesn't this seem kind of arbitrary? Is this kind of OODA4? Is that such a big deal? Well, if you look at Lockbuehler's study of the JMM, he, he has a very similar execution. And what he noticed is that this program is type correct if it declares x, y, and r to be of type d. However, it has a legal execution where they reference a c object. Now, this forced Lockbuehler to partition memory by type, and that's not a very realistic assumption. 
even with this observation, you might say, well, is it really that bad? And the problem here is that the whole idea of thin air executions is, is kind of poorly defined. It's a nebulous, queasy feeling you get. We believe this is the wrong focus. What we should be looking at is what kind of logics we can use to reason about our programs and what kind of compositionality results we get for those logics. In OODA4, for example, I have that any write of 1 to y must be preceded by a read of 1 from x. And in the case that I write z, then any write to x must be preceded by a read of y. We can write this out in propositional temporal logic, and given this, we can ask the question, given that every thread satisfies this property, does it hold for the whole program? For weak models, we can establish compositionality for something like propositional logic, but it's not going to happen for a temporal logic, as OODA4 shows. But for the strong models, I can actually prove or give compositional proof rules for programs like OODA4 and OODA5. In our model, the attempted executions are going to look like this. You can see that um, the star program will be allowed, whereas OODA4 is going to be disallowed due to the cycle. I expect some purists will throw up their hands in horror at this point, but it, it turns out that this problem is hard. We're trying to satisfy programmers who want compositional and local reasoning, as well as implementers who want efficiency on hardware. And these turn out to be difficult to get right. In this paper, we only make one real sacrifice, which is that we're going to focus on MCA hardware. That means that when a write is published to one processor, it's going to be published to all of them. And this is the case for ARM, for x86, for RISC, but, but not for the power processors. MCA prevents certain anomalies. For example, in this program, I write X, copy it through a couple of threads, and then go back in time and read it before I wrote it. You can see that this causes a cycle in the palm set. The study of relaxed memory models began in earnest when Pew noticed that common sub-expression elimination failed for Java 1, and that created a bunch of operational models, which are more or less weak in the sense that they allow OODA 4 and OODA 5, but they compile efficiently. Um, and there's also been a development of a bunch of strong models um, that have the reverse problem. And this includes models from us developed in 2010 and 2016. But there's also been a lot of work. This problem has been around for a while. So what we're going to do here is to be guided just by a few principles which are that we need to have compositionality. We're going to get compositionality a couple of ways. So we want it while we're building the model itself. So we're going to have a denotational model, but also to reason about the model. We want to have reasoning about local races and about safety properties. Logic is the glue that's going to keep everything together. And we're going to use it both in construction with preconditions and post hoc for reasoning using temporal safety properties. The restriction to MCA allows us to include only one partial order. And in addition, the semantics is fairly simple. I can explain it in four slides. The semantics is best understood by example. So what I'm showing here is a simple program and one of its implication minimal palm sets. So you can see here the precondition R is zero is required to produce this uh, right action. Of course, I could have different values for R and that would give me different palm sets. If I write R twice, I'll end up with two separate events. And of course, those might have different values. However, if I'm seeing different values for R, then I have an inconsistency, and this palm set would be disallowed. Now let's take a separate program and look at its palm set, in this case a tautology, and I'll embed those two inside of a conditional to get the two arms of an if-else. In this case, the implication minimal palm sets include the extra precondition on R simplifying the preconditions and then combining them into an if-else, we end up with this program. And what's happened here is I've coalesced the two rights to x, taking the disjunction of their preconditions. We can only coalesce rights of the same value. So if I were to write 2 in the condition, I wouldn't be able to coalesce it with the right of x is 1 here. And in fact, this palm set is not even consistent because I have contradictory preconditions. Let's start fresh here. If I prepend a read from y, what's going to happen is that I'll substitute y for r throughout these preconditions. When I add in the read action, 
I need to ensure that those preconditions are consistent with the value that the read action sees. Incompatible reads are going to lead to inconsistent preconditions, which are disallowed. I can introduce order from the read into one of the writes, and in that case, I can actually perform a substitution of the value for the variable. Prepending a write also performs a substitution of the value for the variable, and in this case, no order is required. Simplifying tautologies, we end up with this palm set here, and that pretty much explains the sequential semantics, how we deal with preconditions. So looking at fulfillment, we first note that we need to preserve program order between conflicting axes, such as those to y here. We also need to initialize all of our variables. In order to fulfill y, I need to add another thread, which will actually give me the value I'm looking for. And we need to follow the requirements for fulfillment to fulfill those reads. Once I've done this, I've actually got the palm set for star, the program that we saw earlier. This palm set is allowed because it is a partial order, there's no cycles, and all of the reads are fulfilled, and all of the preconditions are tautologies. Note that UDA3 is disallowed because of the evident cycle. The semantics gives the expected results for store buffering and load buffering litmus tests. Synchronization and fences are fairly modular aspects of this definition uh, expressed in these four conditions down here. And this gives you what you expect for publication. So for example, if I have a releasing write, it's going to follow in palm set order everything that precedes it. And if I have an acquiring read, it's going to precede in palm set order everything that follows it. And this is enough to give you uh, the publication idioms you expect, as well as correct behavior for sequentially consistent access and fences. The coherence requirements in this model are stronger than those of Java in order to get local data race free reasoning and weaker than those of C++ in order to get common sub-expression elimination. One of the biggest challenges in a relaxed memory model is the concept of an internal read. This is a read that is fulfilled by a write of the same thread, more or less. You can see this in the Java memory models test case one which uh, requires us to ha have this behavior. And this falls out in our model for free here. So note that this read of x does not necessarily need to introduce a dependency into the write of y. We can actually leave that dependency out and instead satisfy the precondition of y by using the value written locally for the initializer. Internal reads play nice with synchronization without doing anything special. And it's really nice that this just sort of falls out of the model. The model validates many expected program transformations, including reordering of independent statements, uh, Roach Motel, which allow things to go inside the scope of a synchronization, and various forms of elimination, such as redundant fences, redundant reads, common sub-expression elimination. And also we have scope extrusion, code lifting, case analysis, dead code elimination, dead store elimination, store forwarding, irrelevant read elimination. Some of these do require a little bit of extra work, which we discuss in the paper. In the paper, we discuss many transformations, but not all of them. So for example, redundant write after read elimination, we believe it's valid in the model, but we haven't proved it. There's many things that are sound observationally, but are not valid in the model, such as access mode strengthening, commuting synchronizations, implementing synchronizations using fences. Other transformations are sound observationally in some contexts, but still are not valid in the model. This includes access mode weakening and lock elision. And other observations simply aren't going to be valid observationally, including thread inlining, relevant read introduction, and write introduction. In the paper, we prove local data race freedom, which states that if I have a stable synchronization point and I do some reads, well, then I'm not actually going to be polluted by reads from the past, as shown by the cycle here. Racy behavior is also quarantined from the causal future. You can see an example here where uh, a future race is sort of polluting something in the past, and again, disallowed due to the cycle. The main results we give are compositional proof rule for propositional linear time temporal logic, the efficient ARM implementation, and local data race freedom. There are several limitations to our study. We haven't looked at loops or sequential composition. We haven't studied mix size access or really validated Java's final field semantics, which may require address dependencies. Um, we've been limited in our treatment of optimizations and the compositional proof rules. 
But the main objection I've heard to our paper is that we're not handling non-MCA architectures, such as power. Having only one order does simplify things for a programmer, and it also simplifies our proof of local race freedom. But it's not completely fundamental to our model. We expect that by adding in a second order, one could possibly compile to MCA uh, efficiently while maintaining the good properties of our model. Revisiting the principles that have driven us, we emphasized compositionality, both in the construction of our POM sets and in reasoning about them. And we've used logic as glue here, both in construction and in reasoning about our POM sets. By choosing to have only one order, we have simplified the model for programmers. Thank you very much for your attention during this talk.